Hey frother, welcome to the Nave Stereo Podcast. If you've never been called a frother before, well, where have you been? Because we're all about that frothing spearfishing stoke. And I get to interview spearing legends from all over the planet that share that same passion, that same stoke. So today, it's two brothers. It's Matt and Ben Crisp. These boys are watermen through and through. They uh, they crewed the pro sailboat Condor while we were up on the Whit Sunday Spear and Sail Charter, and I got to do a live interview with the boys uh, in front of the rest of the guys, and uh, it was a rad experience. So these boys, jeepers, they know how to tell a yarn. I'm telling you, listen out for some uh, some serious scary stories and uh, some wicked spearing adventures. Um, before we get there couple of quick shout outs while i was up in the wood sundays i stopped in at a fresh island seafood shop called fishy um a bloke there cullum he's a spiro absolute legend took in like 25 30 kilos of fillets and uh he helped vacuum pack and blast freeze them and he's just an absolute gentleman sharing stories all along the way so shout out to fishy uh an early there absolute legend um callum if you're in the, in town stop by and see him he's a, he's just awesome anyway hey cliff harvey left me a review he said hey mate uh loving the podcast isaac i've listened to almost all of them now get 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 to hear from all of the spearfishing legends from around the world have learned so much i'm sad to say this but i love the poo stories too so funny should catch up for a dive sometime soon uh cliffy's up on the sunshine coast just up the road from me uh, an absolute gentleman as well. Hey, Stalk Outdoors podcast. I don't know if you're familiar with this. My buddy Andy emailed me before he started the podcast. He interviews frothing spiros, fishing fanatics, adventure lovers from all over the world. He's also a massive bow hunting flavor on there. He's about 10 episodes deep at the moment, and uh, but he's had Trevor Kitchen on, Tim McDonald, and uh, his podcast is absolutely rocking. In two weeks' time, uh, I him on his show and he's on mine uh, and we had a we had an awesome time but if you're looking for another awesome wicked spearfishing podcast check it out stalk outdoors podcast absolute gentleman legend um the tassie guys I, I don't know the tasmanian fisheries were putting forward some legislation that was going to restrict a lot of access for spiros uh the community got up and we did it that's been uh, the amendments have been dropped and uh so good news for the tassie spiros wanted to share a bit of good news um and other news though Lahaina in Hawaii. I've had a few messages. Um, lots of lo- loss of life in that area, like in- an incredible tragedy uh, in Hawaii. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the fires that swept through there, but it, there may be like a thousand people uh, missing and presumed, you know, presumed dead. And massive spearfishing community in that part of the world. And I just wanted to, um, if you if you see some crowdfunding campaigns and it's run by you know reputable people, and they're going to make sure that that stuff's used in the right way. Uh, 100% get up and uh, do that. There's a lot of groundswell, like good movement there amongst the the locals there to support some stuff. So keep an ear to the ground for that and uh, look after our spearing community. We are 100% a, a global family and uh, all of us share the stoke for spearfishing. But yeah, Lahaina, check, check it out if you haven't already. Um, Noob Spiro is still on the lookout for a new partner, maybe just one new partner to help uh, bring this podcast to you. We're always on the lookout for people that provide a good service or good product for our spearfishing community. Noob Stories, go to noobspiro.com, head up into the menu, give back, hit Noob Stories, Noob Stories, leave me a voice message to go on the podcast. I'd love to hear uh, particularly about an actionable bit of information that has changed your spearfishing game. And last but not least, Noob Spiro spearfishing courses and trips are up and running and banging, I'm telling you. Go to spearfishingcourses.com.au. Um, courses are selling out. The first one, September, sold out. It actually oversold. Uh, the first of the first course in October is selling well. And then I'm doing an intermediate course in November. And I've got Tim McDonald, Trevor Ketchian, and Tom Sandstrom to come help me teach it. Hopefully, Blaze Parsons, the photographer, is going to come join us as well. And uh, it's an intermediate course. So I'm trying to do more for our spearfishing community. If you guys are up for it, check it out, spearfishingcourses.com. I want to get into this interview though. The Crispy Brothers are off the chain. Here we go. Shop for your spearfishing gear at adreno.com.au in store and online. You can use the code NoobSpiro to save 20 bucks on any purchase over $200. Why would you shop with Adreno? I hear you say, well, let me lay it out. Flat rate shipping, $9.99 on all orders hassle-free returns policy, Australia, 
price match guarantee. Shop now, pay later with Afterpay. Fully sick brands, huge, obnoxiously ginormous range of great spearfishing gear made just for legends like you. Go Adreno, go pro, don't be slow. Shop massive spearing gear at Adreno. I'll stop, Shrek. That's a no no. But seriously, shop with the Noob Spiro's longest running partner, Adreno. Head to adreno.com.au online or in store at their huge mega stores. Use the code Noob Spiro to save 20 bucks on any purchase over $200. Buying gear online can be tricky. You ask yourself the same questions Will it arrive on time? Is it actually what I want? How much is the shipping going to cost? Great news, the name you can trust is Neptonics. Neptonics have route package protection, basically insurance on your gear so you can have peace of mind. Free shipping to the lower 48 when you spend $199 or more. Clear, transparent communication on shipping time and most gear ships in two days. They also have my favorite, a no BS returns policy. That's right, no BS. And it's all backed by one of the strongest names in spearfishing. And it finishes with tonics. And it's not gin and tonic, it's Neptonics. Solid gear that works. Visit Neptonics, buy tough gear. Use the code Noob10 to save 10%. That's right, use the code Noob10, N-O-O-B-10, to save 10% on your order at Neptonics.com. G'day, Noble Legends. You are joining us back aboard the Condor. I'm joined by the uh, the illustrious Crisp brothers, Ben and Matt. We are having an absolute blinder of a time on a charter off the Whit Sundays, um, largely in part due to Captain Crisp and his first mate, Benny Crisp. Um, welcome to the News Fair pod- Podcast, boys. Oh, absolute pleasure to be here and back at a nice, not rolly anchorage after the weather we've been playing with. 100%. We've had some... Uh, We've had some cranking wind. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Casual 15-knot forecast turns into 40-knot squalls on the way home. <laughs> yeah, a couple of broken things, a couple of sore spirits and sad faces, but we, we we got there in the end, mate. We got there in the end. Yeah, it only took six and a half hours to get to the lee of an island, but hey, oh, we're all alive and smiling. Snapped the baby stay, lost the GPS. <laughs> <laughs> Boat was sinking. <laughs> hey, but it didn't. And hey, but it did. We had bilge pumps. That stay was was that off the off the main? Like what, that one there? What do you, you call it? A baby stay? Yeah, yeah. baby stay. I was basically doing nothing at the moment except for like holding the front of the boat together a little bit. But it, um, <laughs> yeah, it actually not mission critical. Not mission critical. Nice. Yeah, probably the least important stay on the boat. So at the front we have three that hold the rigging together when you point to the wind. Most important one being the four stay, the most forward stay on the boat that you hank your heady onto. Mm. Um, you tension that up with the back stay, that thing's still going hard as nails. Then you have one back from that, the inner four stay, obviously in between the two other stays, and then the baby stay is the little baby one. So yeah, nice. we lost the least important one at the most stable part of the mast. Didn't completely lose it, just a few little wires came off it and made her go slack but yeah boing <laughs> <laughs> well he's a good sound though like 40 knot winds gust to the 50 just like boing yay <laughs> yeah so turn reassuring. the music up boys <laughs> <laughs> we had some good tunes some very interesting like uh psychedelic bush stuff almost like that's how i'd categorize well you gotta you gotta keep the vibes high mate when stuff's <laughs> going wrong and it's blowing. <laughs> you kind of gotta put some bass over the top of the wind yeah. Nice, nice. I like the vibes. Um, when I told people like on the New Spear community I was doing a sail and spear trip, they were like, why ruin a good spearing trip with a sailboat? Comment on that. Like, I've had a rad time on a sailboat. We've had cranking winds, but it's still been like a hell of an experience. I've really enjoyed some of the sailing moments. Could you imagine being out there on a boat without a sail that can pull you up out of the ocean? Like even one of those big like white boaty type things going out there would have been the rolliest trip on the yeah, planet. 100%. Huge seas, 40 knot squalls. Might have had a bit more luxuries, but getting out there wouldn't have been any more fun. Mm. And I think that the sailing, like, I'm not sure anyone on here has ever sailed a boat this big before, but mm. in 30 to 40 knot squalls, that's pretty sick. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. another tick off the list of things that people can, you know, like I said, 
everyone here gained an extra couple of hairs on their chest after that one. <laughs> yeah, and these boats were designed in their heyday to cross oceans, so they've been through a lot heavier, gnarlier, bigger conditions with the sea state and what have you. So, yeah, we're always in safe hands of the mighty big bird condor. So, mm. yeah, no stresses there. No hairs were standing up on my neck. Yeah, no, I love it. We had a um, pretty wicked anchorage too, like... Um, I'm loving the the, uh, the plumbing sounds in the background. It just adds to the interview. Like, there's nothing like that authentic sound of someone's shit just being squirted out the back of the car. So. Yeah, that, that's okay. Oh, yeah. The water oh, pump. Oh, cool. boys doing all the hard yards in the galley at the moment, actually just using water. I think on these boats, everything does need to be pressurised, not like the mains at home. It's pretty typical of the News Fair podcast. We're always talking about shit anyway, so it's all good. <laughs> um, boys, how long have you been doing this? And, um, I mean, you, you grew up together. Where did you grow up? And have you always been part of the water? Like, is sailing in your blood? Um, yeah, actually, sailing is in our blood. I'll answer the first question first. And that is, this is actually my first trip. I just lied on my resume. Um, you do everything with confidence and you can get really, really far in life that I've found out, you know? Crack it with a smile. Confidence is key on that regard. Definitely haven't been doing it for five years on this boat, but hey, who knows? Um, Benny and I grew up in Cairns, a little bit north of Cairns, in a little place called Yorkies Knob. For anyone that knows it, really small population, one little primary school, one sailing club, also the local pub up there. <laughs> um, her father was actually a ship's captain for 30 years. So, mm. yeah, we did actually grow up on boats, but we did have a hiatus in our um, teenage age years where we moved down to New South Wales and that coastline and that's where we both actually started getting into diving and surfing and being a bit more in the water babies ourselves. I personally used to veto school whenever I drove to school and saw that it was a nice day. I'd sign in, see my first 10 minute class, get my name in there so they wouldn't call my parents and I'd fuck off ski for the day and go <laughs> diving. So yeah, that's me. Headlands, New South Wales Headlands. Yeah, what, what yeah you, New what, South Wales Headlands. Anywhere that I could go for a shore dive in the lee of some of the wind. Mm. Yeah, just hunting brim and the colder water craze and I was hoping for a kingy to swim past as you do. Nice. Cheers, Matt. And Ben, your your origin story, brother? Um, yeah, so Matt also left out that our mum's a yacht master as well. Oy. So dad's a skipper, mum's a yacht master. I actually spent the first 18 months of my life on a sailboat. Um, they were uh, kind of yacht sitting for this rich German family that my dad knew. Uh, yeah, so we went, like Matty said, down to Coffs, moved away from the tropics and all the tropical reef fish. And then um, I guess mum and dad tried to put us through university to make us real humans, but we fobbed that off real quick, moved straight back to North Queensland, have been spearing and sailing around ever since. You know, yeah. <laughs> the ocean, once the ocean's got you, it doesn't let go. We both managed to achieve a uni degree. What we've done with it, not so much, though. <laughs> yeah, like Matt's a skipper and I'm a videographer, so. <laughs> nice. Take nice. that, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> All your hard work, Mum, it come to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, but it's pretty good. Like, our relationship with our parents got a lot better once we graduated that. You know, they felt like they did it, their job. And we were like, thanks, we're going to go back to the ocean anyway. What did you guys study? I've got a degree in international business, majoring in marketing, management, and macroeconomics. So oh, I'll wow. take that, man. Thriller. <laughs> I, started, I studied civil engineering. I did not do well on that within two weeks. So I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> and then I moved down the path of the hippie and I studied marine biology for about six months before I realised that every hippie and his goat does that course and there is absolutely zero job prospects <laughs> in the real world. Yeah. So, hello. so, yeah, my first year at university was basically behind a bottle of wine um, and then I managed to graduate with an environmental science degree. Nice. Slightly more useful but generally, like, hard on your old moral compass like some of those jobs as well. Like, they, yeah, they can be a bit wearing too. The marine biologist's handle was a weird one too. Like I meet so many forklift operators with a marine biology degree. So <laughs> I, I hear exactly what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And glass bottom boat drivers too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you boys clearly have some um, some nous about you with regards to the water and massive respect for the ocean. You guys have both got vibrant, really cool personalities. Great energy to be around on the boat. Um, Say more. 
<laughs> it's, it's all true. Like all of these guys that agree with me, we've had an absolute blast, and you guys have um, brought really good energy as well as the other crew. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be on board. What's it like putting on a trip like this? Like in terms of like the weight of responsibility, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's good. Honestly, these trips are definitely my favourite trip that we do run on these boats. We do a um, bunch of varying different charters, whether it's like backpackers, yogas, free diving, hiking retreats. Yeah, the spearfishing charters that are a little bit longer are definitely where it is at because we do get to go wide and experience some things that the vast majority of the populace will never see. Yeah, like I think that these spearing charters, yeah, it is a lot more responsibility having people in the water, but you attract a better crowd. You know, you get people that are all on the same page, all want to do the same thing, and like it's. Instead of just having people that are, you're trying to entertain them on a nice voyage, it's like everyone wants to get deep, everyone wants to get good fish, and then at the end of the day, everyone's frothing about the same thing. So it's mm. it's all worth it. And um, yeah, like I said, I just froth getting people onto fish that have never got before, and these trips are the perfect way to do it. Mm. You know, like we go wider than anyone, we stay out there almost longer than anyone, and then yeah, it's a bit different vibe doing it on a sailboat. Mm-hmm. Ben, I'll, I'll come back to you actually. Um, I think you and I started chatting about how you really got serious about spearing. Talk to me about like um, your introduction really into serious spearfishing and some of the things you learned along the way. Yeah, so um, Maddie was actually always the bigger diver growing up. I was too busy surfing. Um, I'd jump in with him from time to time and a couple of my other mates, but I got my start actually through, uh, really got pushed to the next level by the boys at Back to Basics. They put the call out that they needed a videographer and I was up in the north at the time and we had a mutual friend that put us in touch and they ended up picking me up off the side of the highway in Proserpine and we spent, <laughs> <laughs> literally, that's the first time I met him. And then we spent three weeks filming for BCF and Great Northern on Northwest Island. Sick. So I kind of lied on my resume a bit. They asked, can you dive and hunt at 20 metres? And I said, I can get to 20 metres. <laughs> and <laughs> basically when I first started, like I'd dive down on the boys filming them and I'd have to go back up to the top, get a breath hold, and then go back down to film them actually shooting the fish, yeah. which got a little bit taxing. So the boys basically took me on a trip, just me and them, and were like, we need to get you deeper, we need to get you down there longer, and you need to you know, keep up with us. So for three or four years working with them, they just pushed me through the, I guess, the avenue that I needed to go to get better quickly. And mm-hmm. yeah, it was kind of mission critical that I did. So yeah. I'll, I've dived with both of those boys. They're both weapons in the water. They're both absolute gentlemen, though. Um, but talk to me about, like, going from bomb diving 20 metres, maybe, like, just for, sort of, like, almost just forcing it, to what was the, some of the things that allowed you to start getting down there and hanging out there? Like Slowing do down. Yep. Slowing down. That's the biggest thing. Like, it, when, you, when you've got pressure on yourself to get deep and, like, you're flustered and you're not breathing up very well, you're never going to have good bottom time. The way to do it is just learn good breathing techniques, maximize your time on the surface, and then the slower you can get your heart rate and the less active you can be on the way down is how you maximize your time down there. And mm-hmm. it's kind of one of those things you've got to work out for yourself. Mm-hmm. you know. And yeah, definitely you've got to put yourself through the paces, but just slowing everything down is just the way to go. Like panic never makes any situation better. Yeah, love ever. it. Ever. <laughs> Awesome, Ben. We're going to come back to your journey. Uh, I want to touch base with Matt. Matt, um, you guys have both got really good fish sense as well. And this is a massive shine on session. I'm like fanboying hard here. <laughs> but you guys um, have a really good sense for like the lay of the reef, putting people on the right drift lines and planning like just planning a sort of a sequence of dives. You guys don't seem to waste a lot of time over unfruitful ground. Talk to me, Matt, if you can, about some of your rules of thumb for like a good spearing session. Like what what are your do's and do not do's with regards to hunting in particular? With hunting, um, yeah, as you're saying, it is definitely better to find a correct mark, especially out at the reef. It's I find that it's a bit of a boom and a bust cycle with the reef and where it's growing, what tidal movements are doing. A lot of it is just like 100% exploration and finding out what actually works for the ground that you're hunting on whether it's the lagoons or like a deep reef edge and you need to learn the tides as well the tides play a very crucial role out at the reef the tides at the reef have their own natural eddies and currents and which ways that they do and 
If you look at a chart, the chart's not going to tell you everything that you need to know. You honestly mm. just need to get in the water, figure out what the drift's doing, mark it down, remember it, remember what works, which way the tides run on what point, and honestly, find the pressure, find the bait, find where everything's happening, and find that mark. Don't spend countless hours in the same spot where it's dead. Mm -hmm. Move. Uh, you know, like, I'm not being critical of anyone in particular, but, like, when you're learning, sometimes you sort of get carried with the way like, oh, sweet, I've had my surface interval. I'm ready to dive. And then you just dive regardless of sort of what you're over. Um, talk to me about looking for bait. Like um, what am I looking for? I'm, I'm doing a drift dive. I'm, I'm humming along the surface. I'm ready to dive. When, when, when should someone time their, their, their drops? Uh, it's not only just bait that you're looking for. You're looking for structure down there as well. Like you'll see there'll be – different tangents and gradients of the reef like yesterday we drifted over some ground that had like a nice slow sloping drop off a bit more like broken rubbly reef and you see the fish don't actually congregate and hang around there but then that came up to a much steeper wall drop off in a bommy and then you could see that there was a whole bunch of bait fish hanging off that bommy where there was that change in ground still the same amount of depth but a definitely change in the structure, and that's where you find fish hang. So, yeah, I know little changes, little structures, little, like, isolated pockets of life or structures, definitely a good thing to choose and bomb down on those. Yeah. Yeah, I think also a thing that helps is, is, is just kind of knowing your species and their behaviours. You know, like, if you find a good ledge and you're going down there and you're like, I hope there's a fish there, it's like when you're, you're like, looking for, like, you know, you might get surprised by something down there. Mm. Where if you know a mangrove jack might be on that ledge, you know, you bomb down, you're looking for a jack. Or that's a good hole that might have a trout in it because, like, that looks quite trouty. Or, like, that bomb me right there with an undercut <laughs> ledge might have a cray in it. Like, kind of knowing what species you're looking for in what location. Like, sandy bottom, like, looking for spangos. Uh, staghorn coral looking for, like, a tusky pit. It's like... Kind of knowing what species you're looking for to drop on the structure helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And I know that people that are starting out might not know that, but just spending time down there without pulling the trigger is a great way to work out how fish operate and where they might be. Where you're likely to find them, yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's just like that, you know, this is, this is a saying in like the business world or the self-improvement world, like 10,000 hours is like your minimum for mastery of something? Like... I know you guys have put in your 10,000 hours in the ocean, you know. Do you think for a lot of these guys it's just hundreds and hundreds of hours observing and learning and cataloging? You're saying, like, I'm looking for a ledge and it's trouty. You know, like, I, I, yeah. I, I can kind of hear what you're saying, but it's like for people, like, it's a little bit obscure. It's almost like you've got to do it a lot yourself to kind of get that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, I, yeah, hundred percent. Just put the time in, and you'll you'll get the expertise. But I heard another good quote the other day. It's like a thousand hours makes you better than ninety five percent of the population mm -hmm. at something. And a thousand hours is eighteen minutes a day for a year. Yeah, nice, nice. Bang, that's not much time. Mm -hmm. So even if you average that out and you go for a three dive, three hour dive a week, mm -hmm. by the end of that year, you've done a thousand hours in the ocean. Yeah. And whatever your ground is around your house, you probably should know how it operates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and like with a trip like this, like a lot of these guys have got sort of 10 plus hours and they've had a, a couple of looks at different parts of the reef, but it's during one time of the year, during one particular tidal phase, one particular moon phase. So it's a good snapshot, but it's not like a comprehensive look at the reef either. That's where local knowledge, I guess, really comes in handy too. Yeah, but then when in doubt, find the bait, find the fish, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll come back to Maddie. Red throat seem to be fairly abundant, like this time of the year. Like a number of people shot them, like it, it, not even super deep or anything like that. That was pretty cool. Is that something you guys see regularly here? Yeah, red throat are pretty abundant out here at the reef. But, um, another thing, red throat, different to spangos. You just find the little rocks and nooks and crannies compared to the sandy bottom. And yeah, you'll find red throat quite often around these grounds there. Fun to shoot. Grunting is definitely my favourite technique. Line on the bottom, grunting. <coughs> that sounds like me. <laughs> sounds like me in the morning in the bog again. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly with too much iron, iron supplements. But anyway, I better not talk about that. My wife will get embarrassed. Um, what about other species you think like are a real good sort of um, benchmark for uh, people out here on the reef maybe for maybe maybe their second, third trip. What are those kind of species you like seeing people 
Throw over. Mangrove jack every time. I froth so hard when a jack gets put on the boat because those are elusive, they're fun to find, and, yeah, they're always a little bit deeper and a little bit cheekier than you think. Which one of you was in the water with Sam when he... Yeah, that was me. Me and Sammy actually had a hilarious moment in the water together. We were hanging off this beautiful bommy. Actually, the bommy that I was talking about earlier where it was a little bit uh, slow gradient to a deep drop-off and a big bommy where the pressure was. And we found this crack down the side of the bommy. And I was watching Sam, and I was like, I know he's ready to dive. He's doing that little fin flutter as you do on your last couple of breaths before you do your duck dive. And I was like, he's going down there for a sick bomb. And, yeah, he's... Drop down, take another two breaths, watched his form, dove down on his fins. And then, yeah, he's taken a shot. I haven't seen what it was at all, and his spear's gone into the reef. He's absolutely cooked it, missed. Um, and I'm like, oh, I'll go help him pull his spear out of the reef because he was kind of swimming up at this point. And, I don't know, he absolutely crushed it. Spear comes straight out of the reef, looks at me dead in the eyes. We want to have a little moment. I look behind my shoulder. There's the jack cascading back down underneath the crack. I get his float line in my face, try to swat it away, aim my gun at the jack, it's gone. We look at each other again, do some sign language underwater, have a little <laughs> bit of laugh, draw some tears on our faces, and then we literally both still had heaps of breath left and we just pondered back to the surface. It was actually one of my highlights of the day. It was quite funny, actually. Yeah. Nothing like witnessing a kook and then sharing in the kook moment yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, love it. Um, do you reckon spearings as much about the ones that get away as the ones that you actually throw on the boat? Definitely. Tell me about one for you that's like memorable, massive getaway <laughs> moment. All right, so this trip, I think I spent about 40 minutes in the water. I was boat boy making sure that everyone was else getting on the fish. But um, when I jumped in, I was just hunting for, I let a lot of good fish swim, but I just really wanted to put a trophy on the boat, so, you know, to jump in and then bring back like a horse to show everyone. And um, I think I put these boys on that mangrove jack crack, but by the sound of the one that they um, lined up, it was about half the size of the horse that I saw. It was like probably would have been my PB jack, like, oh, man, seven kilos in that range, maybe eight, like a decent jack. And I just saw him at the end of my breath hold and I you know, swam into the darkest crevasse that I could and then I saw this huge jack, but I, like, knew that if I shot him and he caved me, like, it would be game over. So I went to the surface and did like the, I guess, a minute breath holders, I mean, surface time and then did a good, had a good breath and went down for about a minute and a half searching every little nook and cranny in this like 12 metre cave for this jack, nothing. And then out comes his little buddy, maybe about like 50 centimetres, 40 centimetres and I thought about pulling the trigger on him but I was like, nah, I'm not taking a consolation prize, I'm going to get this jack, dove another three times, couldn't see him at all. And then on my way back up, these three Spanish swam past. I'm like, sweet, one of those big Spaniards will do. Got to the surface, quick little breath hold, dive down, chase this guy, power stroke towards him, which you usually shouldn't do, but I was desperate to get it. Launched my spear out and it like hit him in the cheek and then pulled straight back out again. <laughs> so I was just, in about like five minutes, I'd cooked like three or four dives, <laughs> let two amazing fish swim. And then by the time I got back to the surface, man, he's like, wrap it up, man, we've got to go get the next group. So... That was me. Heart, heartbreak <laughs> of moment. Yeah. They're, they're crushing. But they, I don't know, they keep you pumped. Like That's It's like the next session. You, you, you're looking forward to like, uh -huh. what do you call it? Like, you know, like when, you, when you, um, you know, like you reclaim the glory even more on the next session if you make up for it. Oh, redemption. That, redemption, yeah. The harder the hike, the better the view. Like back to basics boys used to always say. Or like the harder the mission, the bigger the fish. So like when you miss them, you know, they're going to be out there next time for you to go. Yeah, hopefully, and and I sometimes it's just not your day, and that fish wins. You know, it's a battle. It's a battle every day, and sometimes the fish win. Got a sweet deal for you today, guys. Go to freedivingfamily.com and learn from Adam Stern and a select team of experts on different disciplines. The Freediving Manual is a digital freediving course, one that you can do at home, at your leisure, whenever you've got time. The course contains absolutely everything that a freediving instructor would teach on a freediving course. The digital courses are broken down into a video format and they contain everything that a freediving instructor would teach on a freediving course. 
we have beginner freediving courses, intermediate freediving courses, and advanced freediving courses for those who are working on diving deeper. The freediving manual contains all the safety information that any Spiro could want. Thanks, Adam and team. Love it. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. Again, that's the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. The sweet, sweet sound of equalising on your way down a hunter fish. It's not that sweet, though. In fact, most of the time we don't even notice those sounds until we review our GoPro footage. But sometimes, though, a sticky eustachian tube, an uncomfortable forced EQ or ears that just won't clear can derail your dive day. Sounds like you might need Ted Hardy's Roadmap to Frenzel course, available at noobspero.com forward slash Ted. Equalize instantly and effortlessly using Ted Hardy's Roadmap to Frenzel. If you go through his EQ program and Ted doesn't teach you to Frenzel within 30 days, he will offer you a full refund. Make your EQ problems a thing of the past. Learn more at noobspero.com forward slash Ted and use the code noobspero to save some moolah. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I can trust when I pull the trigger. Kill Shot Spear Guns utilize the finest of kiln dried Burmese teak. Kill Shot Spear Guns also combine American made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off any Kill Shot Spear Gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Matty, I want to hear a story from you, man. Um, have, gather your thoughts, but I'm thinking like a teamwork fish, like somewhere where, you, you know, like you work well in a team. Uh, it doesn't have to be from you know, a, a recent trip. I've got a kook story about a mangrove jack that right. involves a little <laughs> bit of teamwork as well. Um, it's actually one of my funniest stories, but I took a mate down when I was still at uni and we were living in a university village and we were orphans for Christmas. Everyone left us at a village. Everyone went back home to their families and it was just me and my mate Cam. And I was like, you know what, you beautiful Canadian bloke, you can come home, meet the parents. We'll have a time together. And then I'm taking him for a shore dive at my local Coffs Harbour headland. We've got in the water. He's never been spearing before. I've got the most ragtag gear at home. I ended up going to the local shop and buying this the blackout gun that I have now, that thing that's now chopped in half and a 50 centimetre pea shooter. Yeah, I bought that. Absolute horrible gun. We've taken that in the water. And I've only got one pair of gloves. We're wearing like boogie boarding fins as well as a pair of freediving fins. Sharon, I'm like, oh, well, got to get you a fish. So he had the gun for the vast majority of the trip. I had a little pole spear, no gloves. It was... Swimming around, taking pot shots at fish for like two hours, absolutely missing everything, not being able to get in range, seeing a bunch of good fish, not able to get it. I've been buddying him for these two hours, pointing out fish, and I think I've watched him miss about 18 shots back to back in a <laughs> row on absolute sitters. So I'm cracking the shits at this point. And then I'm like, give me the gun. I'm taking the gun, I've ended up. Find a little red rock cod, got that, and then immediately saw this nice jack. So I've like reloaded, followed it through the cracks of the reef and taken a long shot. And I've ended up hitting it right next to the dorsal like spines and it's come straight out of the bottom of the gill plate. And this thing is angry at me. I haven't stoned it. I've got a really good skewering on it, but it's pissed off. And I'm not wearing gloves because I've given them to my mate Cam. So I've run my hand down the shaft, <laughs> split my hand open on the dorsal fin, sliced my thumb out the wazoo. So I've gone, ah, oh, nah, and tried to grab the bottom of the spear that's out near the bottom of its mouth. So at this point, it's latched onto my wrist, started biting me. <laughs> I'm an absolute kook in the water so at the moment. <laughs> Guess who has my knife? Cam. Cam. Cam's got a knife. He's over there doing his own thing with a pole spear. I've got a mangrove jag attacking me. Can't even <laughs> grab it because my thumb's ripped in half. So I ended up managing to wrangle it off my wetsuit on my wrist. That's now got holes in my wrist. And I've got it off and it's slippery and I'm scared of its spines again. 
and then it latches straight onto my inner thigh <laughs> after that. And I've got like five holes in my inner thigh. Cam finally swims over and we can pry this fish off my thigh together and we brain it. And then, yeah, that was that dive done. But that you was a bit of funny though. teamwork. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the fish win, sometimes you win at the same time. So, yeah. That was my funny story. <laughs> not much teamwork in it, though. Just yeah. help on your friend. <laughs> yeah, no, Cam, Cam came over and he ripped the fish off me leg. It was pretty funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's his fish then. Yeah, 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 his fish. Cam got a nice jack. Well done, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> and you injured your buddy too. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Left him with no equipment and injured him. <laughs> I was the one with the bugger all. I wonder how he tells that story. <laughs> Probably the best, Cam's like, best story he's got in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Six foot fish bit me, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, love it. Um, let's go some scary stories, like stuff where you maybe both of you nearly died and you learned, okay, and you learned a lot of shit. I've got one with the... Um, Diving some kingies once again in Coffs. It's always a bit scarier diving in the southern waters around Coffs Harbour, I find, near the solitary islands because that green zone extends quite far around the island. So you're doing deep drops. Like It's always like 30 metres of depth. And even though the visibility gets good out in Coffs Harbour, like even 10, 15 metres feels like six, seven, eight metres of vis sometimes. It's just like... A little bit gloomier, a little bit scarier, you know. You're like diving into schools of surgeons when you see them and nothing really else around. Um, so I've ended up going down to Coffs with one of the boys that I met on a pro cell charter as a decky, and he knew some of the Australian spearfishing champions. So he was my in to go diving with these pros, except for to meet him, I needed to go to the Sea Spew Tavern or the Whoopi Local <laughs> at night and they were on one. So anyway, <laughs> in proper fashion, I obliged and I joined in, stayed at their house that night, woke up with the most raring hangover I've had. We dropped the boat in the beach with the most ghetto tractor I've ever seen, straight off the beach, launched it out to the solitary islands and we're diving for these schools of kingies that are going around the solitary islands. Um, <clears throat> The younger of the two brothers ends up taking a drop. So we're doing 20, 25 metre bombs at the moment. And he's stoned this absolute stonker kingy and he's swimming up, just pointing down viciously. And I was like, this is it. This is the time for me to go get one of the dogs. Um, with that, his brother dove down one breath before me. And I was like, I'm feeling real good. I'm feeling really, really good. Been in the water for a good amount of time now. Um, Getting my lungs back in, so I'm just going to go watch him plug a fish, you know, or like be there for backup. It would be fun anyway. So I've dove down his brother's fins. He's found the school 20 metres, taken a shot, hasn't stoned it, it's taken a run, spooked the entire school. School scatters. Um, I'm still feeling really good. So I'm like, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay down here and see what happens. At this point, pretty negatively buoyant. Sinking, 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 sinking. Um... First urge to breathe comes. I'm like, ooh, need to breathe. School starts coming into sight. Get a, get a contraction. Boom, one contraction. I'm like, ooh, you should go up. Um, I don't go up. I wait for the school to come in. One kingy comes into sight. Not the littlest kingy either, like a 14 kilo guy. Got him on the boat, but regretfully so. I've pulled the trigger, taken a long shot because I'm out of breath. I've hit the kingy about one centimeter underneath its dorsal fin perfectly on its beam so it has not even wounded the fish the fish didn't even realize i shot it at first hey um i'd also shot a kingfish just previous to this that spooled about 35 meters of my line out and with my poor line management skill i didn't wrap it back onto my reel with any tension so i've shot this kingy hasn't realized i've just given it a little cheeky piercing and then it realized and it runs my reel binds up immediately the line slices straight into the middle of my reel and i'm sitting with this not wounded 14 kilo kingy on the end of my line 25 meters deep with about three meters of line out of me with me nice <laughs> one meter roller that i've basically just made a thousand dollar gun that i don't want to lose um so um, down there, I'm like, remain calm, shit's hitting the fan, be calm. So I've checked front of my gun for a muzzle wrap, new gun, thought that could happen, it's happened before, no muzzle wrap, check the drag, loosen the drag up, drag's loose as, can't pull any string out of the reel, it is jammed, it's fucked. Anyway, I'm like, well, 
this is you, bud. Get to the surface. So I grip the handle of my gun, two hands, and I'm just powering to the surface. I dive with some pretty hard fins to give me a bit of gusto to get off the bottom. It makes me feel a bit better. Anyway, this kingy takes three good runs. I'm swimming up, but I'm going down. Um, I get to this, uh, like, quite close to the surface, and it's taken another big run, and I'm just visualizing letting my gun go and just watching it disappear into the depths of this kingy because I just don't think I can make it to the surface. Um, as that thought flashes through my mind, I'm a little bit lightheaded on the verge of actually probably blacking out at this point. The fella that shot the first fish looks down, good buddy dive, comes, dives down, snatches the gun out of my hand, mate way out of the surface. Fuck, I don't know how many recovery breaths I took on that dive. It was probably about 15 before I grabbed the gun back out of his hand, started feeling good and was able to subdue the fish. Um, I was out of the water after that. I did not fucking get back in. I got the fish in the boat, got in the boat, and I was done so I'm glad you're with us, Crispy. That was a hectic story, man. Hectic. Takeaways. Walk us through some takeaways. Like, what have you, what have you changed since then? What are you trying um, to avoid? If I'm ever shooting pelagics, I dive with a float line on my gun, or um, actually directly after that incident, I went straight online and I bought a belt reel. Got a nice belt reel with a um, stainless steel carabiner clip that's super easy to clip onto my gun. That way I have an extra 50 meters of reel. Um, if anything does go wrong with my gun, super easy, just straight off the hip, bang, onto the gun, let the gun go. You got another 50 meters. Um, and then with that, if you're ever on the verge of feeling a little bit gross, a good thing that you can do is you can actually grab your weight belt and unhook it. So you're still holding it and it's still on your body. Um, if your belt reel gets spooled or jammed, then you can just drop your weight belt and disappear. And Or if you do black out, which I hope no one does, then you will end up releasing your weight belt and you should float back up to the surface as well. Sorry, we were interrupted there. I think the poo alarm's gone off. We've filled up the the, uh, the boat's hull. <laughs> it's a rogue drone. Uh, it's a rogue drone. It's a rogue drone. Alarm. This is... People are used to this with the podcast, so it's all good. Mate, some solid takeaways there. What about, what about like, I'm picking on you a bit. What about diving the day after a good night on the piss, though? It is hard. Mm -hmm. Do not recommend. Yeah. Not good for the ears, not good for the sinuses, not good for the breath hold, not good for the tides. Mm -hmm. Some solid gear takeaways there as well. Like, um... A lot of guys that haven't used a reel before probably don't realise how easy it is for that to happen. And I, as you were talking, I was like, "Chief, is my reel was looking like a sloppy piece of shit too." Like making sure you check your reel before you dive is super important. Yeah, it's quite tenuous, like tedious to. Oh, it is. Pull out fifty metres of line. And, yeah, yeah. Before this trip, I spooled my like uh, forty metres of my reel out until it started looking juicy again. I just had the line under my heel, which I find a good wave, so I find it really hard to actually get a good tension on it. But yeah, yeah, if you just stamp your heel on the ground, then you get a good tension to reel it on. But yeah, sore forearm after that one. Definitely don't yeah. want to do it all the time. Nice. Makes a big difference, though. Like yeah, you, you don't die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. Great story, Crispy. Thanks for that. Well, Benny, you got a scary one? Oh, uh, yeah. I got a couple. There's, I got a... Yeah, we'll come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got a sequel. Yeah, I got a couple. This one's almost a funny, scary one. Um, it was oh, somewhere off here, somewhere. We're just diving with a couple of dudes that know what's up. We're in the chase boat, so we, it's a thirty-foot Kevlar cat. We're out pretty wide. I think we're out stucco or joist or something. And um, I'd shot a really good, really good tusky, like arguably near ten, and um. Yeah, put a good shot in it, straight through, straight through behind, oh, just just behind the head. I thought I'd almost stoned it because it rolled over and gave me the shutter, and I was like, "Yeah, game on." So I started swimming up and just like slowly pulling, and then it just sprung back to life and just took off and then wrapped around this bommie, and then um, snapped my shooting line. So it caught on the bommie and it just wore off. And this, I don't know if you've ever shot ten kilo tusky, but they pull string, man. So yeah, so this thing had. Oh, I actually got another one with you, actually, after this one. But, yeah. But then, <laughs> <laughs> Too but then, many stories, these boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, so it snapped me shooting line, and it's a brand-new shaft. This is the trip, the trip, the first time I'd used this shaft, and I was in love with the good Manny sub one with the shark yeah. clip. I loved it. Anyway, so it's 
it snapped me off and it was going for this run with this shaft straight through it. So it had like equal ends of shaft out either side and it was just running through this reef through about 10, 14 metres deep. There's all these scattered bombies and it was a uh, sandy bottom. And then as I was chasing along the surface, a couple of the other boys were following me and I'm like, I want that fish and I want that shaft. Like someone second shot it. So it's running along, running along, running along, and then, of course, the shark brigade starts coming out. There's a couple of little white tips and there's a uh, couple of bronzies and there's one bull shark that are all chasing my fish now. And I don't know why I was seeing red. I was like, there's no way that I'm losing this fish or this shaft. And I was chased and chased and chased and chased and got to the end of it like, I was about to give up. But then this tusky hit these two bombies perfectly and the spear wedged itself either side. <laughs> and this tusky just started doing cartwheels. <laughs> Kicking up so much dust and shit. I was like, I've got it. It's awesome. So I like had a bit of a breathe up and the sharks were all circling it. And I was like, had my mate watching me and I was like, I'm going. He's like, what? I'm like, I'm going. And I dove down and I'm just, I get down there and the tusky's doing cartwheels, like I said. And I'm just trying to reef the spear out of either side of the reef and I just can't because it's hit it with that much force. I've like got my fins against the side just trying to get this spear out and I can't and I'm like, I look up at my mate and he's like, woo, 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 woo. and I'm like, yeah, I know that it's hectic. But then I looked up <laughs> and then literally the scariest, most close to getting eaten by a shark I've ever had happen. The bully charged through the gap in the rocks and whacked the tusky with my hands on either side of the spear. Holy shit. Yeah, literally hit the tusky with either hand on the side of my spear and I like literally closed my eyes thinking I was about to die and then the whole commotion happened and the next minute the bully had knocked me out of the bommie with the spear and the tusky. It's still cartwheeling but it didn't get bitten and I swam straight back to the top and I was like, whoa! <laughs> so, so I got it. So the bull shark actually helped me, but I had the vision of shark, like probably two and a half meter, three meter bully shark, yeah. open mouth swimming at me as fast as it could. Yeah. I had nightmares about that for like, whew, still do sometimes, but I won that one. The fish did not. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, maybe the the bull shark just wanted like a toothpick in it. it maybe was going to use your shaft. Maybe clean something out. He was coming in hot though. As honestly, I don't think that's the closest I've ever been to getting proper munched. If my hands were on the fish, I reckon I'd have one less hand. Seeing a shark charge is like, like it's like you, you swim with them when they're chill, and you're like, oh yeah, sharks. Mm -hmm. And but seeing them in full motion, and I'd imagine like one coming out your teeth open, that'd be teeth open. I've never had that before. Brown. I mean, they've snatched heaps of fish out of my hands, but most of the time they're going for the fish. Even though this time I was going for the fish, I was there, mm. and it was like, yeah. So did you freeze or was it just like... I closed my eyes and thought it was about yeah. to die, literally. <laughs> yeah. Just hanging on. Yeah. Well, I was, yeah. I'd yeah. given up. Any takeaways from that? Oh, um, put a better shot, you tusky, maybe don't dive into... It sounded like a good into, shot, though. Yeah, it was a good shot. I don't know. I just I think that do, if you're diving into the shark pit, maybe have your mate with a gun there ready to help you out. Like, yeah. I think I was a bit too gung-ho and just diving into five sharks and one fish 14 metres deep with, like, Almost zero assistance. I had someone on the top, but if I got smacked, what, the, what are they going to do? They're not. It's hard though, like when you've been pumping into current to dive on something in fourteen meters and yeah. just like jet straight down into sharks. And I can't but, believe having a breath all day. The mm. adrenaline was just that high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you saw that new shaft, and you weren't going to give it up. No. Nah. I got yeah. the tusky too. It was all right. <laughs> I had a couple of tooth marks in it though. It actually wrecked both fillets. What, but <laughs> what did it weigh? You reckon? Oh, we didn't end up weighing it, but it was it was a horse, eh? It would have been eight to ten, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. In you said range. you hadn't got one over the ten, eh? I've got one over ten. Have you? Oh, yeah, right. just. Oh, nice. Ten point four in Brazil. Oh, yeah. yeah big boy of northwest. I haven't, I haven't got one over ten, eh? What's but your biggest? Such a Nine three. Ah, oh, it's close. Yeah, enough, I know. Mate. It's just too close. It's just like <laughs> piss you off, close. Just put a big crane in his belly, mate. Yeah. Cheat a little bit. <laughs> you get you get them up here, though, eh? You get these big lone pack men, and they're just such a like. It's a such a unique fish for Australian waters. Like nowhere else in the world do they get them. And they, I don't know. Like I look over at Florida and they get their hogfish, and it's kind of that same thing. They're not super smart, but the big ones are like they got big for a reason. Oh yeah. So um, we sh we've seen a couple come over the boat this trip. Like Craig's one was pretty impressive. Oh, Craig's was an awesome one, mate. Yeah. It was his first one too. Yeah. Horse. Horse. Yeah, absolute donkey. I love seeing that happen. Eh? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think Tussie's 
they're like almost a Pokemon for me where they've got like three stages of the evolution. Yeah. There's the like little baby ones you don't even look at, Then especially black spots. Then there's that stage they go up where they're like green and bluey and they got the black spots very vibrant. Mm. You get them, they're illegal. But then they go to the big horse, blue bone, Pac-Man looking things and it's like three different fish really. Mm, mm, mm. Or like a Dragon Ball Z reference, like a Saiyan sort of thing. Yeah, Super so. Saiyan level three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Love it. Oh, God, let's come back to Crispy for another scary story from him. Oh, can I just jump in and get Crispy to remember that time I shot that Kobe off that bull ray and wrapped me up? Yeah, you, you tell were it. having an absolute fucking shit time. <laughs> 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 Oh, yeah, I don't know. So I can't actually remember where we were, but we were at the reef and I was having a fucking amazing day. My brother was having a fucking shocker. Yeah, that's the first memory that I have of this day. I remember him on the surface looking at me, having a little bit of tanty about something. It happens to the best of us. 100% it does. 100%. Anyway, I've just got a probably 55, 60 centimetre trout on the spear um, and that was previously followed by about seven of them. So I was having a rip snorter of a day. I was great. I was shooting things left, right, and so center. Six of them because the back yeah. limit seven. So it's just yeah, you're in your That's back it. limit. Yeah, I don't know. Bit, <laughs> bit of mayo on the story always <laughs> I'm helps. I'm just um, So anyway, I see Benny, and he's having a tanny on the surface, and out of the oh, corner. I don't remember having that bad of a day, but yeah, <laughs> he had absolutely zero fish on the boat. Um, <laughs> Yeah, when I said seven, it wasn't seven, just trout, it was combined species. I know, mate, I know. Um, and then, so I've pointed out this cobia to him. It's about 20 metres away. We had a rip snore of a viz, 25 metres of viz that day. And he's like, where the fuck is it? And I'm like, it's over there, sitting on a bull ray. You just need to go swim over to it. And he's like, mm, and I just send him off on the mission. I'm like, go that way, look down, you'll find it. Anyway, he does this really, really good breath hold. Swims down. Gets down onto the bottom. I'm following him, watching him, and he shoots Cobia straight through both of his eyes. Just boom. So Cobia is off the back of the bull ray. Spear goes into the bull ray. Just. Just. <laughs> 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 yeah, bull ray takes over the reef, and I'm like, this is going to be a fucking show. Um, yeah, luckily the spear just pulled pretty quickly out of the bull ray. And anyway, I didn't realise that Benny actually did such a good shot because this cobia is having a hissy fit. It's just it's lost. Blind. They completely hate it, blind. eh? Completely blind. Completely blind through both of its eyes, doing donuts. And I was like, whoa, I haven't seen a fish do that before. So anyway, I dove down, put a second shot in it, cooked it as well, didn't stone it, didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> now I've just got two shafts in this fish. It's angry, lines going everywhere. Lines all around my legs too. I'm getting caught up by this fish just taking me everywhere. I'm like, buddy, help me, brother. Oh, hectic. Uh, got the fish in the boat after, I don't know, probably 15 minutes of sorting our shit out on the surface. But yeah, I don't know. It did improve the day for the both of us, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, but honestly, if Matty wasn't there, I would have been in some real trouble, eh? Yeah. Like, I shot that thing through both eyes, and it just freaked out because it was blind, and then started wrapping me in my own shooting line. Yeah. So I was getting constricted by this blind fish. <laughs> he didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to go. And Matty came down and kind of loosened it, second shot at it, and then, like, obviously put a bit out of his misery. But I swam up like a mermaid. Yeah. Like, both my legs together. It just goes to show, like, like even when you're experienced and you're good with line awareness, like making sure your float line's out behind you and swimming up current and all that shit, like stuff happens really fast sometimes and you can get wrapped up pretty easy. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution, bar none, for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. If you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough, 
Just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar, it's less acidic than other options on the market, it's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just one to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to six or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored for Spiros and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. Did you know when coming up from a spearfishing dive, it's possible that you would feel 100% fine right until the moment you blacked out? Did you know being dehydrated or hungover increases your risk of having a blackout? Did you know I have never seen a person hit the surface and yell, Tad, help, I'm about to black out, come save me. No, they typically hit the surface, take a couple of breaths, and then quietly sink into the abyss. Whether they live or die is 100% dependent on if you are close enough to grab them and take care of the situation. Did you know it's very easy to have a loss of motor control or a minor blackout and not even know that you had one? Did you know that if you have a loss of motor control or blackout and you continue diving that day, you are way more likely to have a much worse blackout? Did you know breathing across the eyes of a blackout diver can help initiate a breathing response? That was 60 seconds with me. What else don't you know? My name is Ted Hardy, the founder of Immersion Freediving, and I want to do more to stop the needless fatalities from shallow water blackout than any other person on the planet. And that's why I created freedivingsafety.com. Lucky for you, I made it very easy to get up to speed. You can learn how to reduce your risk of having a blackout, how to save your buddy's life, how to tell if you're wearing too much weight, and avoid breathing techniques that drastically increase your risk of having a blackout, and it's all for free. Go to freedivingsafety.com and sign up for my free safety course. Dive safe out there. It's not even that hard, especially when you learn for free at freedivingsafety.com. Ocean Guardian is the world's leading shark deterrent technology company. Since 2001, their independently proven and tested products have been allowing ocean goers all over the world to enjoy the ocean without a worry. With products for diving, spearfishing, surfing, snorkeling, boating, and fishing, They've got you covered for all your ocean activities. Their technology is so effective, the Western Australian government offers a $200 consumer rebate for the purchase of the Freedom Plus Surf and Freedom 7. Uh, Guys, get into it. We've got a discount code for you, 10% off your Shark Shield device. If you want to get the Freedom 7 or the Scuba 7, get 10% off. Use the code NoobSpiro at checkout. If you are at Ocean Guardian uh, US site or ANZ site, uh, get into it, get in amongst that Ocean Guardian are doing awesome things for Spiros. Yeah, let's talk about some line awareness, some mm. stupid decisions mm. and doing way too much at once. So, <laughs> <laughs> on that note, if you ever get on board a sailing boat with a certain captain that is not very responsible and you decide to do a drift dive over a seamount 200 nautical miles away from any land with a head sail still up and a lure trailing off the back with you and that captain dragging behind the boat holding onto ropes with two float lines <laughs> off the back. <laughs> it's probably not the smartest idea. <laughs> Holy shit. That so, is loose. We were hungry. We hadn't got any fish for six days sailing. We wanted a fish. <laughs> so we've drifted off this seamount. And when I say seamount, we're in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. It's 4,000 metres deep to 10 metres. Yep. It is hectic. So we drift over the first phase. Well, we actually sail over the first phase. It wasn't At speed. That. At yeah, speed. Yeah, yeah. I know. We're probably doing about four knots or something. Oh. Um, but, yeah, with a furling head sail, easy to wind in if anything did hit the fan. Um, but we drift over the sea mount and there is nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. Go over a few unicorns and we're like, what the fuck, man? Like, there should be fish here. And we drift off the sea mount and I'm like, well, that was super, super boring. With that 
dog tooth tuna just comes straight up out of the wazoo. And I'm like, holy shit, it is on. There's doggies. So I signal the boat. I let go of my line, start drifting back. As soon as I let go, doggy smashes the lure. We've got a little rapala off the back on a line as well. Like, I don't know, probably five metres off the back of where our float lines were hanging. And as the doggy hits the Rapala, it's on. I am grab onto my mate's float line, so I'm still dragging him. He's holding onto the boat. He's holding onto me, doing four knots. I'm screaming at Danny on the boat to reel the doggy in on the line. As I've done that, I've looked back in. The shark has smashed the doggy off the line, and then a hundred more shark have come out. And now I'm fucking dragging my mate off the boat. There's a fucking hundred sharks. There's dog tooth. There's more doggies trying to eat the Rapala. The, sh- <laughs> the doggy just got fucking eaten off by sharks. It is absolute scary fucking mess. I'm screaming at my missus to <laughs> furl the sail in so we can get the fuck back on the boat. Yeah. That is uh, hectic. Yeah, bad decisions. Multiple bad decisions. <laughs> so you guys were hanging off like a mermaid type situation? Yeah, just off a little 40-foot sailing boat and we just had like uh, five-metre ropes with knots tied in them that were just <laughs> hanging off the back of the boat. It was like, I don't know, it was like 70 metres of viz out there so you could yeah. see everything. So, yeah, I don't know. We thought we were sweet men then. Yeah, just sharks just out of the gloom. Lots of them. Wow. <laughs> well, you gotta eat, you gotta eat, Martin. Yeah, man. And to put this in perspective, the Rapala was about three meters off the tip of my fins with a dog tooth tuna on it that got eaten by a fucking shark. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. So, how many more drifts did you do over that <laughs> zero, zero, zero. Yeah, you're done for zero. the day. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. We went to Fiji after that. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, that's hectic. Those seamounts are like a experience that few people ever get to witness because they're out in the middle of nowhere. Like, have you had some real cool experiences on those types of structures just coming out of nowhere? Um, Apart from nearly getting eaten alive. Only that seamount, and I also dove a little atoll called Beverage Reef where we got some unbelievably sick fizz. Like, oh, I can't even just put into words to describe how good like 50 plus meters of fizz is to dive in it's, and and warm water too, like 28 degree warm water. We're just like board shorts <laughs> on, diving down to the anchor chain, nothing else, standing on the bottom, just like legit, like doing 20, 25 meter dives like it was yeah. nothing. Um, same thing, um, we drifted around that reef and just yelling to the boat, like, how deep is it? And they're yelling back 50 metres, and you can just see further than that. I remember I had a watch on and saw some fish on the bottom, swimming down, swimming down, can see the coral, looking at these little plates, just swimming down, swimming down, kept swimming down. And I was like, what's going on here? Check my watch, 30 metres, not even closer to the reef. (laughs) I was like, I'm going to die. I'm just going to go back up. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, cool experience. Yeah, super cool. It's it's cool when the water's that clean. It just makes you feel comfortable, eh? And you can oh, sort of see what hundred percent. You can see what you're capable of, especially if someone's watching you. Yeah, yeah. I find that uh, some people say diving in dirty water is easier because you switch your mind off a bit more. Mm. I like seeing. Mm, love it, Benny. Another scary story, mate. Or tell us like a special hunt. I'd love to hear some. Uh, some big fish stories. Yeah, I was about to talk about some sea mounds that I've bombed. Oh yeah, sweet. Um, yeah, I was I was lucky enough to do a couple of trips with the Back to Basics boys to Samoa, um, and that place is just next level. Like everyone in Samoa, if you spearfish, they think you're a crazy person, and they treat you as such, like in a good way. They think you're just like the craziest dude on the planet. They'd never jump in the ocean. So there's actually a lot of good fish around. The stuff that's close near the island has been fished to death. But then once you go a little bit wider, like we were diving on some mounds that the skipper, the Samoan skipper was saying, I don't think anyone's ever jumped in on these before because they're like 70, 80 miles off like uh, mainland, mainland Samoa, whatever you can call it that. But yeah, it's literally in the middle of the ocean and these things are coming up from like 1,600 metres to about 60. And we were, um, yeah, we were obviously hunting, hunting dog tooth and we had a couple of boys out there that paid a fair bit of money to to chase them and yeah for the first four or five days we were just basically getting skunked like we could see the doggies on the top of the mound the little white dots swimming around in 60 meters and 
it just feels like you can swim down and get them, but you, you max out at 30, like 10 metres past a 20 metre flasher, and you're like, that's still another 30, 40 metres to go to get down the bottom. And as much as we tried, we just couldn't really get them up for the first couple of days. Like, we're getting good Spanish, get a couple of good jobbies. Um, and then every time we'd fail at that, we'd go pepper some reeves and just see like, buffalo emperor everywhere, schools of long nose. It was... It was good to get a couple of elusive um, emperor species under the belt, but the sea mounds are just something else. When you can see for like 150 metres in every direction and you can see that there's like oceanic white tips over there just cruising and spaniels over there, it's it's a different level. Mm. And it took us about five or six days to actually land the big dogs, but the day that it turned on, it turned on. Everyone got a sick fish. The boys have paid money, both got 40 plus kilos, I think, 30, 40 kilo dogs. And those are some serious teamwork. Mm. Like, it, I don't know if you've ever tried to swim a three atmosphere float down underwater yourself. <laughs> you literally struggle to bob the thing under yeah, the water. Yeah. You shoot a 40, 40 kilo dog tooth, it'll rip three of them to the depths that you can't even see them anymore. And I remember the first one that we shot, I was on, I was filming, I was getting paid to film there. So I was, I was filming the boys and I filmed the shot and I was right next to the floats as they got ripped down on the first big one. First shot, obviously no time for a second. The boys didn't really tell me the game plan. So right, so I've witnessed these three three atmosphere floats. So nine atmospheres just getting ripped towards the depth by this 40 kilo fish. And I was freaking out. Like I grabbed onto the last one and I started getting ripped down towards the depth. And I'm looking up at the boys and they're all like waving across their necks, being like, what? Are you? No, 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 no. And I'm like, I'm trying, we're going to lose it. And I pop back up the surface and they're like, why'd you let go, bro? You lost the fish. And I was like, really? I thought I was about to drown. They're like, you were definitely about to drown. That was the dumbest thing we've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like, shit, what, what? And they're like, look, we're all going to get back in the boat now and those floats are going to pop up somewhere. Then we jump back in, we fight the fish then. After it's all tired and shit, I was like, Whew. they're like, Benny, you're 70 kilos of nothing, brother. You're not going to stop that. And I was yeah. like, shit. <laughs> and then just like the, the next level of then the boys all getting on the float line and taking time to rip this thing up and keeping it off the sharks and two dudes diving down, warding sharks off, another guy putting a second shot in, bringing the first one in the boat was literally the loudest I've heard five dudes ever cheer ever. And, yeah, and then it just turned on and then we got two and then three and then the back to basics boys both got another good one. And so, um... Yeah, it was just... It that, ended up being a sick trip. It ended up being a sick trip, and we ended up back on the dock with all the Samoans, and they're waving all the big dog twos around. We were like king of the village for a night or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah the chief got all these, everyone to come around, and we cooked up a huge feed, but that's I diving. About the surgeon. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so like the day before, right, so they knew that we were like filming, fishing, and like we got a bunch of good species to them, but each day on the dock, there'd be more and more Samoans ready for like, to get a feed off us. And by the fifth day, the day before we got the big dogs, um, it was like half the village down there. <laughs> and we were like, to tour, the captain was like, how funny would it be if we just tell them we got one fish and watch them share? And I was like, oh, how about that surgeon we've had kicking around the bilge for like six hours? So I was at the front and I was like, oh, this is the only fish we got. And they're all kind of like, awesome. And we're like, what? And then we gave it to them. We were like, oh, no, we're joking. And before we could even show them the other fish, they've started ripping it apart and just eating the dog raw straight off the <laughs> straight off the jetty. And we were like, oh, that's been in the petrol bilge for like <laughs> fucking eight hours. And we're trying to get it back and they wouldn't let us get it back off them. And then like we were showing them all these other fish and they were like, wait, just to finish their surgeon first before they'd received like the trout and the long nose and the dog tooth. But yeah. actually we didn't have doggies that day, but yeah, they surgeons, man, they love them. And tiny coral trout. The smaller the better, they reckon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, there's one time we were drifting and the, the skipper, we, he was fishing the whole time. He was awesome. He's actually an ex-priest, yeah, right. which makes the next sentence a bit weird. So he caught the smallest coral trout I've ever seen caught on a hook. And as we were on the boat and we were like, oh, you're going to chuck that back? He's like, no, 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 this is the best. <laughs> and we were like, mate, that thing was born yesterday. And he was like, yeah, born to die. <laughs> and then we chucked it back and he was off us for the rest of the day. He was like, you need to go get me one that size. And we're like, we're not shooting a trout that small. Yeah. And he didn't get one for the rest of the day and he was off us. He didn't even sit with us for dinner. He went and sat with the rest of the, the <laughs> local boys at the little farlow. Oh, <laughs> Some, sometimes, like you see it with different people, like they, they, 
they don't have that same idea of like, hey, we'll let a fish get to a certain size because it's had a chance to breed. It's kind of like they just know what they like to eat. And yeah, yeah. If it's yum, they'll bang it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Ross, like Ross, you, eh? yeah, kind of like <laughs> <laughs> facts. Say less. Say less. <laughs> Your brother Ooh. got you there, man. He clean. He got you. Yeah, mate. Um, you boys are a good laugh. Um, funny stuff over the years. What's something that stands out? Maybe from a trip like this. Some <sighs> funny from a trip like this. I've got. Oh. Any poo Sorry. stories? Oh, I don't know. You, you got to know. Oh, so many poo stories. Yeah, give me a good poo story. I love poo stories. Oh, Maddie's got a good poo one. <laughs> My favourite. Okay. Anyway, so as you do, you clog toilets and boats from time to time. Pretty delicate plumbing. We've got propeller blades that force our poo down the toilets and do the bits and bobs and the things. So everyone's gone diving. And they have left me with a toilet bowl completely full to the brim with shit. <laughs> when we say, if you fuck it, we will fix it, we mean it. Because whoever this individual was has got that toilet brush. They have not done any courtesy flushing. They have put heaps of toilet paper down the toilet, heaps of poo, and then just use the toilet brush to jam it in as hard as they possibly can. Probably with a stabbing and pushing motion. <laughs> so, the propeller blade will not spin whatsoever. You press that button, all the lights dim. Basically, the whole boat tries to shut down. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, there's only one way around this. Toilet's so full anyway, even cutting off the water, a little bit of water in the pipe, you press the button, toilet overflows, there's shit water all over the floor. <laughs> all right, everyone's diving. They've all avoided this. Good for them. Here's me with my two yogurt containers from breakfast shoveling poo water out of this toilet, running it across the floor into the other toilet to try and make less poo water for myself to contend with. I think I did about six runs before I scooped as much as I could and then I've gone to pull the macerator apart. What you guys might not know is a macerator is the propeller blade that sits in the toilet and grinds up all your things into little bits before it goes into the black tank for treatment. And so I've pulled the macerator off the back of the toilet. The remaining poo water's gone all over the floor as it does and the macerator's completely chockers with shit. So I've got gloves on. Pulled all the shit out of the macerator, all the hair, all the detritus, all the crap that you can think of, yeah, all the yucky things. And I've made the bold mistake of testing the macerator before I put it back in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a one-time mistake, Alan. <laughs> was this part of Ollie's induction, the story? So, if you ever want to test if a macerator works... Put it in a bin and then press the button for a second. <laughs> Do not just hold it in your hand and press the button. <laughs> because it went... <laughs> and it flung shit in a perfect line all up the wall, all down the roof, all down the leg. Anyway, I put that back together, covered myself in bleach and, yeah, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> Is that what inspired, like, your... Um... You know, ship induction for us newbies on the boat. <laughs> Is it, you got to blind us. You got to learn the hard way. Yeah. <sighs> We've done pretty well this trip. If I just jinxed it, you fucked us. <laughs> 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 Mate, that was a that was a blinder of a shit story. I love that. Thank you very much. Highlight of the You're interview. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Benny, you got one. Or oh, mine's not as good, but I got a pretty funny one. I don't know, I can't even remember when it happened, but we were, we were under sail, right? And one of the packs comes up and they're like, oh, I think there's a problem with the forward head. And I'm like, define problem for me, sir. And he's like, well, there's brown water everywhere. I'm like, were you the last one in there? He was like, no. Nah. I'm like, then how do you know that there's brown water everywhere? He's like, oh, I just checked. I was like, you've been down there for five to ten minutes, brother, to tell me the truth. He's like, yeah, it was me. And I was like, all right, sweet. So I come down and open the door and, like, it is, like, a ship's door opens up and there's, like, a little bit of gap. But, like, this boat is tilted over and there's, like, 
almost knee deep of brown water sitting in this thing and we're sloshing around and like these boats tip over 45 degrees so i've got one foot on the wall one foot on the floor in the shit water trying to work out why the toilet's overflowing it's been set it's to the point where you just forego the gloves and put your mask and snorkel on isn't it yeah i <laughs> probably should have done that to be honest but no I, I actually didn't even grab gloves i didn't have time it was just shit starting to like oh Anyway, so I got straight on it, flicked the thing back to overboard and just started pumping and pumping and pumping and was dropping all this brown water back into the toilet and finally got it all down and then bleached the whole thing under sail on a 45-degree angle and got everything ready to go. And then, like, I looked down and right next to me is the, 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 the bin bag that's been floating around next to me the entire time. And someone's dropped a huge bin poo in the <laughs> bin. So after cleaning all this grey water and finally boosting myself, I pick up and there's a poo in the bin. And I'm pretty sure it was the dude that clogged the toilet, tried to unclog it and put the poo in the bin. And <laughs> shit. <laughs> Happen. It happens way more than you think. It's actually a joke we have. We could bin poo, bin poo. <laughs> <laughs> and is it always the newest crew member that has to deal with? That was me this time. I've been here forever. But, oh. yeah, us- usually it's a good induction because, you know, then you can work out if they want to stay on the boat or not because that'll happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeepers, that's two blinder stories of that sort of experience. I guess if you have ambitions to work in that field of career, like maybe just come work on one of these boats. The most impressive one that I had was actually on a – Children's charter. I don't know if I should be saying this. <laughs> I don't know. It was like uh, young kids, 13 year olds, and uh, broomstick, not condor. And there's a toilet right next to the main companionway. And there's all the boys crowding around the toilet. It's the last thing that you want to see in a kid's <laughs> charter. And they're all laughing and pointing. And I'm like, all right, you little whippersnappers, get out of the way, get out of the road, move, 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 move. And I look in the toilet. And honestly, I was just impressed. <laughs> I was just impressed. There was the largest turd in the toilet, and it was dark, like black in colour, and it was sitting perfectly like a T-piece over where it was meant to go down. (laughs) So there was no physical way that this poo could flush down. You press the thing, it just spirals and just spins around like a compass trying to go down the drain. So what do you do? Put a glove on, throw it out the window. (laughs) (laughs) what did the kids say were they just laughing (laughs) nah nah I closed the door they didn't see (laughs) great news for the people that are not a fan of the tax man the men in grey suits the nasty buggers that like to sometimes show up and try and ruin Ah, a fun spearfishing life. Ocean Guardian have got some great things for us. We have got the Freedom 7 and the Scuba 7, which also come with a discount when you use the code NoobSpiro. Visit noobspiro.com forward slash OG, and that will take you to Ocean Guardian's site. Check out some of their stuff. They have got the best stuff on the market, bar none. It's powered by Shark Shield technology, the world's most effective electrical shark deterrents. They're scientifically proven and tested, backed by multiple published research papers, tested and approved by governments all over the world. They continue to innovate in this space, and the Freedom 7 could be perfect for your spearfishing life. Get 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro on the Freedom 7. Just head to noobspiro.com forward slash OG. Check it out now. The Freediving Manual is a video manual that contains absolutely everything that I would teach on one of my freediving courses. Everything broken down video by video so you can effectively take a freediving course at home. The manual is perfect for any Spiro who wants to brush up on their freediving knowledge or get up to date with all the latest freediving safety and performance knowledge. Great news, guys. Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the new Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one. There's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com. Get Adam's course and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Killfish with precision and power 
sending shafts from a stable platform with kill shot spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any kill shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Nuba. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, Crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotspearguns.com, based in the Florida Keys. Often on the Noob Spiro podcast, we are promoting freediving courses, particularly run by Spiros. It's fantastic knowledge, safety and awareness, physiology, all the stuff you need, the knowledge you need in order to spearfish safely. Um, but even better, if you, and particularly if you're in the southeast Queensland corner, come and do a spearfishing course with me. I run them over on North Stradbroke Island. You can check them out at spearfishingcourses.com.au. Up right now, there's beginner courses, intermediate courses, and I run them with frothers, and we just have an absolute blast. Check it out, spearfishingcourses.com.au. Come and join me. <sighs> that was a blinder. We're nearly ready for some Q&A with the, with the rest of the guys here. A um, couple of uh, practicalities, I guess. Um, equipment. Um, what do you guys do different with gear than everyone else that you've noticed? I wear it. one kilo of weight. Mm, mm. Where are you neutral with one kilo of weight? Like 10. Yeah. So you're just like a naturally not buoyant guy. Yeah, I guess. Mm. I don't know. Is it an old wetsuit or? No, I think I just fart a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just contain it. That's why I need, that's why I need four and a half Yeah, kilo. you're all full of farts. <laughs> Benny, you? You guys both use green bands, don't you? No, well, Matty just tied them up before this trip, actually. Um, but I, I don't know. I just I find that I I just carry minimal kit, to be honest. Like, oh, just one kind of set of everything, extra shaft, mainly the only thing. But I just like to travel as light as I can. I know that a lot of people here have come up from a long way and they've brought a lot of gear, but the almost the less the less stuff you need to get fish is almost more impressive in my opinion. Mm. And I've always considered that. Like the less amount of money that you've spent to get a fish makes it more impressive than, you know, some dude on a $250,000 boat going and getting one tusky with a fucking $5,000 gun. Mm. You know, I mean, the dude out there in a tinny <laughs> with a buddy Rob Allen tuna and a borrowed old surf wetty smoking king, he's like, that to me, that's that's proper spearing. That's going hard with the least amount of gear you've got. But that being said, I got a nice wet hair, a good gun, and everything. But yeah. my foot pockets are twelve years old. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still running plastic fins because I haven't glued my, my fiberglass are together. They my ones, the Salvamars. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've got stolen fins. That's they're that's all, it. They're also twelve years old. I think you guys like obviously frothed in spearing conditions that were say like less than tropical. You know. And then, like, when you come out and you get opportunities to do this sort of stuff out here, like, it just takes your froth to a whole nother new level and you have a real sense of appreciation for it. Oh, 100%. Like, this trip was not easy diving. We're out there 25, 20, 35 knots, fair bit of current sometimes. But, yeah, the sea state was up and, I don't know, I just think that when it's gnarly, you appreciate the fish more. You know, if it's glamour glass out and you're smacking heaps of good fish all the time, sometimes it feels a bit easy. Let's go backwards and forwards a couple of times, boys. Just give out some of, like, your tips for... Let's just start with new divers and then maybe tips for intermediate divers to keep keep improving. Righto. New divers, uh, time in the water, practice equalisation. My best tip for new divers is equalize on the surface before you actually dive like as soon as your ears are in the water do your Vasawa technique pop them ears and equalize often frequently as you go down that's going to help you out heaps if there's any pain anywhere any discomfort just go back try again uh, i guess my biggest one for beginners would be to don't be a surface spearer you know it's good to good to hunt ground and hunt fish but a lot of times if you see a fish and you dive at it 45 degrees angle, that fish is going to look at you like a bomb coming from the sky and be like, I do not want to be here anymore. So one of the best things you can do when you begin is to try to get to the bottom before you start hunting. And that it's going to maximise your breath hold. You're going to look way less scary to the fish you're trying to approach. Yeah, and just you're generally going to be better because like the fish, like we talked about earlier, Shrek, like that when you're on the bottom, they don't see you as hectic as a predator if you're in the midwater like coming down at them. And, um, yeah, to just slow it down. Get to the bottom, slow it down, 
and just take your time. Oh, and I guess, yeah, that's probably my, my best tip. Nice. Uh, one of my tips uh, might not work for everyone, but it definitely works for me. Um, I like to try kick my mammalian dive reflex in nice and early. So basically, as soon as I get into the water, I take myself for a dive. Um, I don't do a deep dive or anything. I maybe just dive down to 10 meters. That's personally a nice dive for me. Might be four meters for you. Um, and then I just like to sit there until I feel a little bit uncomfortable and yucky and want to breathe. And then I go back to the surface and that makes me feel more comfortable in my dives to come um, because I don't want to see a fish and then drop down and have that first early initial uncomfortable dive. I want to get it out of the way, get it out of my system and tell my body, this is what we're doing. I got one more. I think another thing that a lot of new Spiros tend to not do is to, to, like, to dive without the intention of shooting fish is really good for your hunting. Because if you go down there and you just be a placid thing in the ocean and you see how fish react to you, to other things that you do, without not a gun in your hand, just watching fish and trying to get close to them, that's a great way to get close to fish with a gun in your hand. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be keen to just pop this random shot because you've seen something awesome. And you're going to be way less flustered because you, you don't have a kill machine. You're just there to observe. Yeah. Some solid gold there, fellas. Yeah. Go for a good dive and you'll get a good fish. Always put your emphasis on, this is going to be a sick dive even if I don't get a fish. Yeah, and getting closer to a fish rather than powering your gun up heaps and taking long shots is obviously a great way to get better at spearing. Love it, boys. Um, last question before we get to um, Q&A with all these guys. It's a, it's a philosophical one, so have a think about it if you need to and pause. But like in one or two sentences, what does spearfishing mean to each of you? I think it's one of the most impressive things that a human does, to be honest. I think it's like it almost takes over as a way of life. Like when I moved up to the north, I needed someone to replace surfing because like surfing is like you get up every day, you surf, you surf in the arvo, you're constantly checking the conditions. Spearing's the same. It's like for me it, it is, I don't want to say, it's a bit of a way of life, you know. You're constantly checking the weather once you get addicted and you see those patches of like nice little neap tides with bugger all wind and you just get super excited and you want to go out there and get it and then like... I don't know, it's an addiction. That's the word I'd use for it. It's addictive because you're constantly getting better. You're pushing yourself deeper. You've got new species. And then, you know, once you get to a certain level, you just want to teach other people because uh, it just helps, so, helps in so many other aspects of your life, like being able to control your breath, being able to know that you've got the guts when push comes to shove and a situation gets hairy. Mm. Yeah, so an addiction, but a good one. That was sick, Ben. Awesome. Matt? Honestly, I just like diving and spearfishing for all aspects of it just kind of takes you away from your day-to-day -day life mm. i find diving and spearfishing to be like kind of a bit of a mental temple as well as a wrestle with yourself um diving is largely mental like it's breaking down your own mental barriers and seeing what your body can achieve and personally being down there when you do a good dive everything else shuts off and it's just you in that moment doing whatever you want to do in that moment nothing else really matters and that's something special that i don't really think you get too many other places um so yeah as benny said is really addictive and you do start chasing more and more little hangs and spots and you're always on that weather radar so yeah checking maps yeah it's a hobby it's a passion it's addictive as hell and it is a really good time and you get to feed yourself in one of the most sustainable ways that you possibly can on the planet you get to see your environment hunt your fish be way more selective and sustainable than the vast majority of the populace out there so yeah it is uplifting refreshing really good for the soul that was awesome, boys. Both of you were very shit at doing it in one or two sentences, though. You both had a full book, but I 100% get it. And uh, it was really, like, poetic. And it, it, um, I think we can all appreciate that passion and froth that you guys have. It's absolutely evident. All right, well, you give us a two, <laughs> one, two sentences then, <laughs> right. yeah. let me Let me be cliche. It's a lifestyle. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> nah, um, awesome, boys. Hey, where can, um, where can people come and find you? Ben, you've got a YouTube channel, Ben Crisp. Uh, yeah, you find me, Benny Crisp, on Instagram, YouTube. I've been a bit slack for the last couple of years because I've been doing a lot of filming for other people. Like, Back to Basics took a lot of my steam out of my sales, doing a couple episodes for them a week, made it really hard to do it for me. But 
if you jump on my channel and tell me you want some new videos, I will pump them out for you. Nice, nice. There you go. Benny Crisp on YouTube and Instagram. And Matt? Um, on Instagram, I am known as the Deep Sea Wangler. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know why, that's a story for the campfire. Okay. And oh, a few beers. The Deep Sea Wangler on Instagram. All right, let's get out to some of these cool people that have been out on this trip with you guys and enjoying your hospitality. Um, Hans, who wants to ask some of these boys some questions? Uh, what are your boys' favourite species to eat and how would you prepare it? Spanish mackerel. And it doesn't even matter, bro. <laughs> you eat that shit off the bone, you put it in ceviche, you cook it on the barbie, whatever you want. I don't know. Chop it up, dry it out, put it in a powder, snort it. Spanish mackerel is the bee's knees, the duck's nuts. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's up there for me. I've probably got a split right down the middle, somewhere between largemouth nanagai. I think that goes pretty hard in every single way that you can cook it, and it's like pretty elusive to catch, and oh, it's just yum. And then secondary would be like saltwater barramundi cooked scale down on the fire, bang. Ooh, I've seen the boys do that. Yeah, that's where I learn it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's so good because I got the big scales and stuff. It just holds the heat so well. Tusky up there as well, straight on the fire with the big scales. Anything on the fish anything on the fire, on the fire. bang. Do you yeah. add anything to it? Like just salt or oh, butter? Oh, salt, lemon, yeah, garlic, salt pepper. Yeah, right. Yeah, stuff Love. the guts up if you want. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Evan. Awesome. Any, who's next? What do you reckon the most underrated fish is out of here on the reef? Shark mac. <laughs> he's saying that because we caught one today and we cooked it up because everybody says they taste like shit honestly tastes like spanish mac i love it good question and he's only mad at me because i made him chum a really big one to try and get some spanish <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Good question, Sam. Nice cheeky one. Eckhart. Um, do you guys have a uh, dream list in terms of, you know, what's the next thing that you guys are chasing? Is there a species or a place possibly? I want to take down a ruby job fish. Yeah, nice. Normally a deep water fish, eh? Yeah, jobby's on my list as well. I've never actually shot one. I think. Seen green, heaps. Green jobby or rosy? Any, any jobby. Jobby's like my fucking elusive fish. They're actually one of my favourite fish to eat too. Jobby's I know. Delicious. I've seen heaps of them shot. I've eaten heaps of them, but I've just, I just, I'm, they're, they're just my ghost in the wind, eh? Nice. Good to have, it's good to have those fish, man. Oh, they keep you getting they out there. They keep you going, yeah. 100%. Good question, Eka. Who's up? Yeah, the conditions on the trip were probably less than ideal in some cases, especially probably on the sail home today. For us inexperienced guys, it was all pretty happening. But for you guys, you look like a pretty well-oiled machine for the most part. Was there any oh shit moments for you guys at all during the trip? <laughs> I don't think really, no. I didn't have an oh shit moment once on that sail home. I had a few, oh, this is getting a little bit hairy moments. But I was never worried about anything, you know. When we got hit by that 40 knot squall, I was actually having the most fun on the sail. <laughs> Couldn't even really see. Stingy rain in the eyes. Had to bear away. We only had mainsail up at this point because the jib proved to be too large. We set and when it was forecast in the 15 knots, and it felt like 15 knots when we set the sails, and it certainly wasn't after we started getting moving and getting that apparent wind up and we were way overpowered. Um, but, yeah, no, nah, man. Boats hold strong. We did break the baby stay, as I said, but I don't know, man. Insignificant when you don't have the heady up and there's not that much stress on the rig. We're all good. Get the inner four, stay tension that bad boy up and we're sweet as. Yeah, we get asked that question a lot. Like a lot of the time the boat's like tipping over and like, uh, like the railings are in the water and you can see people white knuckling and then looking back and the crew's like, whoa, yeah, whoa, 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 we're sailing. Like it's it's because we're having a great time. We know what these boats are capable of. Um, there was one moment though when me and the boys – kept trying to tie the head sail on the front and it kept spilling back over and there's a point where it was like full of water and we were, took all three of us to drag it back on the deck not that it was an oh shit moment but it was like a i don't know if we can get this thing back on board right now <laughs> yeah it was, it was the, that was like 
a split second of, man, this is kind of sucking. And we're getting smashed around in like two or three meter seas, just going up and down, having to hang on. But loved it. Honestly, loved it. Yeah. Oh, I think I honestly yeah. think. Shh, don't tell our bosses. Nah, they'll, be, <laughs> they'll definitely hear about it. I think my only real oh shit moment was today when the music wasn't working, and I was like, oh shit, vibes aren't going to be as high as I want for this six and a half hour sale. Mm. But yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Ollie doing a doing a bung run in the tender, and then hitting a wave, and then pinching the fuel line, and then stalling it out, and calling it in like. It was it was gonna be bad, but he ended up getting it started in like the next five minutes. He didn't even need to get a rescue, but yeah, we had contingencies there. But that was that was probably the one when the, the fuel line pinched on the tender and Ollie wasn't sure how to get it started again. But we got him on the comms and yeah, just as we were about to spring into action, he was like, "Oh, Ollie, Ollie, uh, Condor, Condor, this is Ollie. Uh, I've got it started. Uh, yeah." <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ollie, they got your voice down, bro. <laughs> oh, it's so good, my bro. Oh, hey, in Auckland, eh? We, we, we do that all the time. <laughs> uh, that was awesome. It's good having a Kiwi Decky here. I felt, I felt right at home. Oh, shout um, out to Ollie, though. He's done a great job. Yeah, yeah. Hats off. Hey, all you boys, eh? Hey. Hats car, off, Ollie. And the car, and Ollie, and the Grizzly. All right, questions? Questions, questions. I'll do another one. All right. Eckhart again. Um, and it's more just a comment on um, how uh, I've, I've chatted to Matt about this, um, but you guys have such a positive attitude uh, when you're working, working together. And um, the one thing I saw, um, and I've seen this before, uh, like being on, on the trip last year, is that when you guys are asking each other to give a hand, a hand with the job, there's not even a second of that, like, ah, oh, you know, the conditions or this or that. It's just, sure, let's go. Um, and that positive attitude, I, I think, um, washed over us as well in, mm. in uh, what could be testing conditions. So, yeah, um, kudos to you guys for, for really being a good team and example, hey. Yeah, much, muchly appreciated. I mean, it, it, it one team, one dream, part of the ship, part of the crew, and... You know, if we all work together, it just makes everyone's life easier. You know, I mean, you can count on the three boys on the boat and you can be like, do this for me now. And they go, yes, dude. It just makes... Four boys. Well, three plus me, myself. Uh, oh, I, was included, I wasn't including myself in that. The three other dudes. You're included. Oh, thank you, Matty. <laughs> but yeah, it's just... <laughs> Oh, you almost, you almost need that on a boat, especially because you're in a small space. Like you need you need the crew to be on point. You know, if yeah. one of the boys wasn't like that, they wouldn't be coming to do this trip. Yeah. Guys, we sort of had uh, not many questions left. Did anyone have any comments or anything they wanted to say to the the Chris boys or any comments on the trip? Otherwise, we're gonna. Oh, here we go. Yeah, what are you gonna do with your phone in the future um, when you when you're uh, looking around for it? As I, I, uh, I noticed that we went through the bins and everything looking for your phone today. Um, yeah, I'm gonna check the stubby coolers before I check the bread drawer. That's for sure, and the bin and the fridge. So yeah, I don't know. Got to put my head a little bit more screwed on. I think. I don't know. I think I was just a little bit frazzled with some of the conditions, and you don't use your phone that much when you're nah. out there because you're out of service anyway. I was only really using it for beats, and there's so much going on, running back and forth for boat as a captain. I literally just threw it down somewhere with no care in the world. Didn't actually throw it down. I put it in a stubby cooler. Absolutely. It silly. feels good to put your phone down when you're out here, eh? Like all of us kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Like we're away from families and stuff, but. It's nice to have that sort of escape from the real world, if you like. And, like, we're out here to spare and kind of get some good mental health vibes going anyway. So putting the phone down somewhere and forgetting about it is probably what all of us should have done. But just remember where we put it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, thank you all for getting down deep and searching for me. I was uh, very, very thankful for that. Okay. Boys, like, like all of us have sort of said, we've had a magic time, eh? Um, thanks so much, and um, I'm coming back for sure. 
<laughs> but I just want to say a big thank you to all you guys too. Like they were pretty testing conditions for a lot of people that haven't dove anything like that before or sailed anything like that before. So I didn't really even hear one complain about anything. And and now we got good fish. Well, at least we had good viz and everyone got decent fish. It was yeah. We, we tried really hard, and to hear that you guys loved it, it, it means a lot. Hey, legends, I hope you enjoyed hearing from Matt and Ben Crisp. Um, tell you what, two characters, are absolute watermen, uh, and very, very funny guys to hang out with. If you're ever aboard a, a pro sail trip, or maybe Eckhart and I's one for next year, um, jump on board spearfishingcourses.com.au will have the info for our trip next year uh, already taking bookings for August next year and hopefully we get a little bit better weather, weather window but I tell you what we had some absolute fun and uh, Matt and Ben Crisp legends hey in two weeks time I'm going to have to chat with Andy from the Stork Outdoors Life podcast spearing, bow hunting, outdoor enthusiast, bushman survival stuff uh, Andy's an absolute madman himself. It's a really cool show. Andy's running a really top-notch podcast. He's had, uh, like I mentioned, Trevor Kitchen and Tim McDonald on the show. And uh, him and I did a bit, like he interviewed me and I interviewed him. And we had a good time. Uh, I was a bit loose by the time he interviewed me. So if you want to go listen to that, check it out on Stalk Outdoors Live Podcast. Or come back and listen to Andy on this show in two weeks' time. Hey, legends. Uh, Massive thanks, as usual, to the patron legends powering this podcast, putting fuel in the Noob Spirit outboard. They can support, you can support the show for as little as $1 an episode. Check it out at patreon.com forward slash Noob As usual, legends. Uh, oh, hey, the spearfishing courses and trips up at spearfishingcourses.com.au. Come and join me for a mission. It'll be fun. Anyway, that's it. Love yous. Are you looking for spearfishing gear in Australia? Head on down to your local Adreno Spearfishing Superstore today and explore their ginormous stores filled with mad gear and frothing staff. On top of a huge selection of high quality Australia price matched guaranteed spearing kit and high quality experts bureau staff, Adreno offer afterpay and a super easy returns policy. Adreno will have you geared up for your next spearing sesh with a massive smile. That's Adreno Spearfishing with stores located in Perth Aspley, Woolongabba, Brisbane, the Gold Coast, Sydney, Melbourne. Get into it. Head in today or shop online at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. Online or even better, in store. Your new spear gear is waiting for you. Are you US based? Looking for free diving, spearfishing gear? Neptonics is the best. Their online website so easy to use. If you've got any questions, Jerry and the team answer questions via phone, email. Anyway, they've got an easy contact form on the site. Uh, these guys are absolute legends. And uh, if they sell it, they believe in it, they back it, they use it themselves. It's tough gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% on any order at neptonics.com. That's right. Use the code NOOB10, N-O-O-B-10 on your next order. Save 10% at neptonics.com. <laughs>